This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 768, recorded on June 11, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello there, Vincent. It's cloudy out. It's cool. Yeah, it is. It's remarkably cool. And I'm, I'm quite pleased with that because it was remarkably hot several days in a row just recently. So um, I presume the whole weekend will be like this, but I'm not sure. 19C and cloudy here. We have yeah. the same weather, Dixon, since we're about a mile away we from each other. I'll bet you, Brienne, I, I would just guess that she's going to say the same thing. Also joining <laughs> us from Madison, New Jersey, Brienne Barker. Hi. So it is rather similar here. Um, it's 70 Fahrenheit, uh, according to my app, which the app says is 27 Celsius. So maybe a little warmer. Wow. But then again, the app also says that it's raining while my eyes say that it is not. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot warmer because uh, here it is definitely 19. Actually, it's now it's 21. Uh, my phone and my watch say different things. Currently 21. So, yep. Yeah. So it's it's gray and looks like it's going to rain. Um, so the app is maybe a little premature. Right. And from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Great to be here. And uh, I currently have glorious weather. It is um, it is clouding over, but it's 72 Fahrenheit, 22 C. Um, it's been partly cloudy all day, and it's just an, an absolutely gorgeous day after a, oh, nice. a rather unpleasant heat wave that we just had. Yes. As you're vaccinated and venture out into wider circles, remember, if you run into people, uh, say, excuse me. Yes. <laughs> and, I, vaccines, I and vaccines Exchange come insurance up. insurance information. <laughs> and vaccines come up uh, that they can attend free town halls sponsored by ASV. Each is hosted by two virology experts from the American Society for Virology. It's a pretty easy URL, asv.org slash education, or you can Google ASV town hall and you'll It'll get you there. And some are now bilingual, English, Spanish. There's one on June 22. Oh, that's nice. Excellent. Furthermore, early bird registration for ASV 2021 ends on Tuesday, June 15th. Mm -hmm. Meeting is all online, July 19th through 23. Recorded material available for registrants a week later. Outstanding keynote, plenary speakers, workshops about careers, teaching, stress management, discussion tables, and a live TWIV, asv.org slash ASV2021. TWIV will be on Friday, July 23, 5 to 6 p.m. Today we have two SARS-CoV-2 papers. You know, I try hard to move away from COVID. There's some interesting stuff coming out. So I thought we would go over two of them. And the first, our little snippet. No, that's redundant. It's a snippet. It's not a little it's snippet. snippet. <laughs> This is a Nature article. It's a single base pair. <laughs> so yeah, it's a SNP, SNP, single SNP, nucleotide yes. polymorphism. Spread of a SARS-CoV-2 variant through Europe in the summer of 2020. And I chose this to illustrate that variants can spread because of human behavior, not because of anything intrinsically different about the virus. And this comes from... Um, group of people uh, at the uh, University of Basel, University of Bern, Fred Hutch, um, many other places. And the first author is Emma Hodcroft, who is responsible for uh, covariance.org. And uh, the last two authors who are co-last authors, uh, Tanya Stadler and Richard Nair. And this includes the Seek COVID Spain Consortium, which is listed at the end and goes for a whole page of people. <laughs> Uh, also on this paper, let's see, names that I, Jesse Bloom, I recognize. Uh, we are 500 scientists and this is what we've been doing for the past 10 years. Indeed. The, yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> one, one thing that I hope people realize just from the title is it talks about the spread of this variant in Europe in the summer of 2020. And we really started talking about Alpha, um, the first big variant Um in the late fall, yeah. almost, you know, right before the holidays. And so this is also important to note that there are probably more variants out there that we don't know about. And those variants are not 
were, did not just actually start in the late fall. They, they were, just don't have such good press agents. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. In fact, this paper just came out, and so it's describing something that happened last summer, and that's how long it takes to analyze the data and get the paper out, right? And so we're we're going to wait for similar. But it's a papers. lot quicker to just calculate a, a, an effective R value and go straight to press. So it's exactly right. <laughs> and boy, that bugs me. But, uh. but yeah, and and they, I mean, they start right off in this paper saying that the the R value is is combining a lot of information in one number, and you can't discern anything like transmissibility from that because no. that's just one factor in determining the no, R. But if that's a good point because, in fact, that has been what's been done to say these yeah. variants are more transmissible. They calculate a new R based on the outbreak. The R value has three parameters, uh, two of which have to do with virus, I believe, and one has to do with human behavior. And they never factor in the human behavior part in calculating the new R value. And that's one of my objections. And here they... They show that human behavior can make a big difference. That's why I picked it. So this uh, variant, SARS-CoV-2 variant, didn't get a lot of press, as Alan said. It didn't have a good press agent, right? That's right. <laughs> uh, what we heard about last year was D416G, right? Or was that also known 614, as D117? Sorry. No, D614G. Oh, oh, right, right. The, the OG variant. Yeah, then... then. Yeah, that rose last, last February. Now is everywhere. Um, and by the way, if you read the final paper on it, they say in the discussion, we don't know if it was actually more transmissible or was just in the right place at the right yeah. time. They cannot know. So folks, back off. <laughs> you know, a great line from uh, Ghostbusters. Back off, man, I'm a scientist. You remember that? <laughs> yes. I love it. When I heard that, oh man, I was in grad school, I think. I said, ah, oh, that's my line. And remember, Vincent, they started in the basement of Columbia. Yeah, University they did. Building. That's right. <laughs> and the funniest <laughs> thing was they go they go to the dean's office right. and he says team. to them, I'm cutting off your funding. And I almost laughed. I said, right, as if we get any funding from, <laughs> from the dean. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. That's right. Okay. Anyway, back to this. This is a variant that uh, arose last summer. It's called 20 e EU1. And the, the important change, well, what they think is an important change is an amino acid change in the spike at position 222 from an alanine to valine, <laughs> which ain't much of a change in terms of amino acids, as many of you know. Uh, it seemed to have emerged early summer in Spain, spread throughout Spain, and then many locations in Europe. Uh, and by the autumn of 2020, most of the sequences in Europe had we're, we're of this variant, right? And so this paper is, why? What's going on here? So they do two things. They do a few wet experiments, right? Where they make viruses and they infect cells in the laboratory. And then they do some uh, epidemiology and phylogeny. And so let's let's take a look at that. Now, this variant, by the way, besides having changes in spike, just like all the other variants, has changes elsewhere in the genome. Protein changes, amino acid changes. And for the most part, they are ignored. And in fact, here, this uh, particular variant has changes in ORF10, the N protein, and ORF14. And they say, we don't have any evidence that these mean anything. Really, I wonder if anyone's even looked. Um, so I wouldn't discount them. We're going to have some papers coming up where people look at these and they make a difference, folks. It's not all spike. Don't put all your eggs in the spike basket. <laughs> it's like the virus evolved these proteins to do something. <laughs> it, yeah, it's almost like changes in them might have some function. Get out. <laughs> yeah, it's not all spike. But I think, I'll, I'll, I'll summarize this in the end, but... Anyway, they focus on A222V. The first thing they do, they make, um, they look at antibody reactivity to see if this is an antigenic change at all. And they have convalescent plasma and they have um, neutralizing monoclonal antibodies that are known to bind the, the receptor binding domain, the RBD, and the N-terminal domain, the NTD. And long story short, these antibodies don't seem to bind any differently to this variant spike compared to the ancestral spike. 
these data indicate that the A222V substitution does not affect SARS-CoV-2 antigenicity appreciably. That's the spike protein. Okay, so no difference there. And then um, what about, they say, let's look at viral entry. So they make lentiviruses, pseudotype viruses, lentiviruses pseudotype with the spike of uh, either the ancestral spike or this variant spike. And then they infect cells. And then here's where I have a big problem. First of all, pseudotype, in my view, is not going to tell you anything relevant to humans. And the cells they use are 293 cells, human embryonic kidney cells, which also are irrelevant for uh, the pathology of, of COVID. And they find no difference. And um, they do say something which I think is very important. They say, however, the effects of mutations on actual viral transmission in humans are not always paralleled by measurements made in simplified experimental systems. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, good point. <laughs> I think it's a very good point. In fact, I would almost say that I, I, I discount these results because <laughs> a, a pseudotype in a 293T tells you only about a little bit about binding and not much else. And, and you know what? It's not in the context of the virus. I think you need to do uh, SARS-CoV-2 in some kind of human respiratory cell. I, th I think it's an experiment worth doing and it's worth including, but... But they stopped there, right? They stopped. Yeah, they I mean, didn't find unfortunately, anything. they stopped there. But it, you do it because it's an easy experiment that may tell you something interesting, and you report the result for exactly the same reason, and then you need to go somewhere else with that. But the thing is, if you found a let's say you found a difference, let's say A two two V gives you tenfold more virus, right? Pseudotype. Then I think you need to go into SARS CoV two in in a respiratory cell and see if you get the same thing. Yes. And then right. even then, what if you get a fourfold difference? What the heck does that mean for what happens in people, right? That's right. the problem. So you're always, you know, they say this at the end, we need to accumulate different kinds of data. But the best data are things that you can get from people. And there's, you know, the only thing we have here is sequence analysis. Right. Right. And, and this sort of comes back to the point about um, people talking about some of these as being uh, more transmissible or having changes in transmission. And if you actually think about it, transmission might have something to do with that very specific binding event between spike and um, ACE2, which you could model in this system, or it might have something to do with some response in the cell, which won't be modeled here because it's an irrelevant cell or some of those other ORFs or something like that, which are not modeled here. And so, um, Yes, this maybe could tell you about one of the many things that uh, are a part of transmission, but there are an awful lot of things that also are a part of transmission that are not addressed in this sort of system. I prefer to think of it as, as fitness, right? Not transmission, sure. as we talked about many times. But yes, that's a good point. Now, what the authors do is say, ah, there's no difference. Let's look at epidemiology. <laughs> and... I, I have a bit of a problem with that because I think this is too simple a system to really tell you any. Just because you don't find anything here doesn't mean you you wouldn't find anything with SARS-CoV-2 in a human respiratory epithelial culture, for example. Right. I think this is, they, they threw some bait in the water, nothing bit immediately. So they pulled it out and they changed tackle completely. Now right. the, they, they, they said, okay, that, that didn't give us any obvious result. Now, if they'd gotten some dramatic difference, if they'd gotten tenfold higher replication or they'd gotten, you know, drastically higher binding or some other significant result in the 293 T cells uh, or the 293 cells, um, they, you know, maybe then you'd maybe. pursue that and you might yeah. comment on it and say, hey, this could be a mechanism. But they, they're, I think what they're doing here is they're just saying, hey, look, we looked at this. We don't see anything interesting immediately. We're going to look at some other stuff too. I mean, and the other stuff in this paper is really the focus. So the other stuff is the focus, but remember, the rest of this is phylogenetics and epidemiology, yes. which is all based on modeling, and that's not the biology well, not, of viruses, right? It's not all based on modeling. Um, so they are they're working with real epidemi epidemiological data that they've got from the field. That's not a model. So they've, they've got data that they're putting into it. They do some modeling. They do, it's fairly simple modeling about, you know, what would happen if. Um, but, um, but that, to be fair, is exactly how these, these variants of concern are getting labeled as highly transmissible, right? Yeah. It's not yeah. 
because of lab experiments, it's because of sequence and phylogeny and field data. And so they're using exactly the same type of analysis here, but doing it a little more rigorously, I would say. Does anybody know where the virus actually started in Spain? This um, particular variant? Oh, yeah. They had something about this. It yeah, was, they said, um, um, seems to have initially spread among agricultural workers in yeah. Aragon uh -huh. and Catalonia, yeah. then moved into local population, was able to travel to the Valencia region, which sounds like a gorgeous trip. Um, <laughs> I've done that we, were, trip. we were actually planning on taking a trip to Spain in summer of 2020. And right. We were thinking about that back in 2019. And then, well, you would have been a new variant then. No, no. We got by, <laughs> by you know. By March of 2020, we knew we were not going yeah, to Spain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess the point well, I want to make is that good. even if you do the right experiments in vitro, if you do SARS-CoV-2 with human respiratory cells, and even if you do an animal transmission experiment, which was done for D614G, you know, and you find two animals are infected by transmission as opposed to one with the wild type, I have no idea what that means for human. It is consistent with increased transmission. But in the end, you need to do some experiments in people, which you can't do. But what, what, what no one has done is to measure infectious virus shedding from people. No one has done that. That you can actually do. You can do that, but no one has done it. And early in the alpha outbreak... You could have actually compared people with alpha and the ancestral virus in terms of shedding. Not by PCR. They did PCR, which is just not a, 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 an indicator because you're getting mRNAs and fragments and so forth. So the right experiments are not done to assess a biological fitness. And the, um, you know, the, as Alan said, uh, the, the reproductive number... It doesn't take into account human movements for the most part. Sorry, go ahead, Rian. Yeah. I was just going to say, part of me wonders whether these experiments were done in response to reviewer comments. Um, <laughs> if, yes. if the paper had really started Maybe. out as more of the epidemiological modeling paper yeah. and they they asked for, well, can you show us this doesn't change um, That's a other very aspects good point. <laughs> of the viral replication? If you look at the beginning, um, it talks about you know when this was submitted and when it was accepted. And it was submitted. It was submitted in the end of November and accepted in the end of May, um, which isn't you know too long in the grand scheme of things. But for one of these SARS-CoV-2 papers, given how quickly these are coming out, that's an immense amount of time. So they certainly yes. had to add something. <laughs> I would that's argue a very that these, good point. if that's true, the order it, in which the experiments are described is not necessarily yeah. the order in which they were done. And I, this is the kind of thing that you might be. Yeah, it is possible that the pseudotypes were requested, but I would yeah. say I would not request those. I think that right. uh, they don't add anything because I'm but, not convinced by them at all. But there are people who would request those. Yes, of course. And that's science. Everybody has a different opinion or groups of people have different opinions and that's fine. But I, I just think the right experiments are very difficult to do. And people do pseudotypes because they're easy. You can do them in a yeah. BSL-2 lab. Yeah. And maybe one day when SARS-CoV-2 is BSL-2, uh, we'll have better experiments done. Um, but I'm always brought back to Ron Fouché. You know, he says, in flu, we never talk about transmission. We talk about fitness. <laughs> yes. And I don't get why the... People are not looking back in the literature and, 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 you know, learning from the past, right? Yeah, well, it's especially nice because we all know that fitness has many aspects. Yes. And it's harder to oversimplify. With transmission, you can just sort of make these oversimplifications that are not true. Yeah, yeah. Um, where with fitness, we all know that those aren't the case. All right, so then they, they do some epidemiolog... Actually, they do phylogeny and epidemiology. So they do, uh, they have a lot of sequences from different countries in Europe. Uh, the earliest were sampled on June 20th, uh, seven from Spain and, and one Dutch sequence. And then by the end of August, that's for this 20 e EU1 variant. We have Belgium, Switzerland, France, Denmark, UK, Germany, Latvia, and more. And then they had Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore, which they've detected between mid-August and mid-October. And they have a lot of nice graphics, which are actually, you can also actually go to covariance.org and see similar plots for today for, for all the variants as well. Um, they see that um, they have a nice plot of the proportion of sequences 
uh, of this variant uh, in different countries uh, by week. And you can see it first rises uh, in frequency in Spain, goes about 50% and then rises to 80%. And then it starts to rise in many other countries in mid-July. And the, the timing is very important here. It starts to rise in mid-July uh, before kind of plateauing in uh, September or October. Sounds like vacation time to me. No, that's it exactly sure right. does. And, exactly and in right. fact, they, I mean, June 15th, I think was the date that uh, the EU that's countries right. lifted most of their travel restrictions across the EU. And right. guess what one of the most popular within EU destinations right. is? It's like the Florida of that's the right. European that's Union. Right. That's Spain. exactly correct. Yeah, that's Costa exactly. Del Del in fact, and that's so the bottom line. Yeah. People, people all headed to Spain which was having this variant spreading and was having a particularly bad time, you know, deal at containing the virus. And um, and all the phylogeny lines up with, uh, and in fact, you were probably going to get to this in a moment. These are these, these increase in case counts that you see elsewhere of this variant, you can track to individual introductions yeah. based on sequence. So yeah. it's repeated introduction of the same variant multiple times to Switzerland and to, you know, all these other countries. And it's because this traveler caught it and that traveler caught it and this traveler caught it and they all caught it in the same place. Yeah. And it's not because the variant is more fit or much more transmissible necessarily. In fact, I think they find no evidence of either of those things in this paper. Um, they, it's just that this is the virus that was in the right place to be exported all over the EU. That's right. Right place, right time. This is better than a radio caller. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the phylogeny can give you a lot of information about this. And you can see they think, you know, most of these variants arose in, Spra in Spain and spread elsewhere. Although, obviously, there's some that arose uh, in other countries. So they say the sequences from Spain are probably not the full diversity of this variant. They probably arose in other countries. And also, they didn't do perfect sampling everywhere, right? Um and so there, there are gaps in the data. Um, and they have um, some of this analysis gives you uh, transmission outside of Spain, two different patterns. And they're, for example, Norway and Iceland have a small number of introductions over the summer, which led to a lot of spread within the country. Uh, and then countries like Switzerland, Netherlands, and the UK had a lot of independent introductions from, uh, from Spain. And you can see that from the sequence analysis. It's quite nice. The thing it says, though, is that Iceland, I'm certain, had very restrictive travel uh, regulations, mm -hmm. like quarantining for two weeks after you get there and all kinds of other stuff, and they still couldn't stop it. Maybe that was why there were a few introductions, right, in part, in Iceland. Yeah, but they had yeah. some. They had some. Well, you can never be 100%, right? We know that. Well, uh, New Zealand was. I don't know what Iceland's travel restrictions were in July, August of 2020. They may have relaxed yeah, some. That's a good point. Um, that's a big, 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 big fishing destination. Sure. I mean, that's billion dollar industry there. Right. But they have, I mean, they have tremendous advantages. They were ver able very early on to just round up the entire country in downtown sure. Reykjavik because the yeah, entire yeah. country lives in downtown Reykjavik. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and they've got, they've got one soccer stadium that will accommodate their entire national population. And so they yeah, could yeah. just bring everybody in for testing. That's right. Um, and, you know, that's, they've got the resources to do that. Right. They make a nice statement here. They say, during a dynamic outbreak, it is particularly difficult to unambiguously tell whether a particular variant is increasing in frequency because it has an intrinsic advantage. That's a biological advantage. And I'm glad they make it vague like that and don't just say transmission, right? That's fitness they're talking about. Or because of epidemiological factors. And they say, we need multiple lines of independent evidence in support of a, and now they go back to the T word, in support of an intrinsically elevated <laughs> transmission potential. I wish they would just use fitness because really that's what it's about. But you know, this is a, this is a disconnect between the, the epidemiologists and the evolutionary biologists and the virologists, really. They, they think in different ways. Okay, so now they're looking at the, the, the what would be responsible for this pattern. And as uh, Alan said, June 15th, borders are open. And uh, travel resumed, and the number of cases uh, in Spain rose from 10 cases per 100,000 inhabitants per week in early July to 100 in late August. 
Uh, and then um, later on, it, it got more numerous in the rest of Europe. So they made a model to see if uh, repeated imports can explain the rapid rise in frequency. Rather simple model, as they call it. We create a simple model, which means even you can understand it. <laughs> and they apply it to individual country data. And they say, well, the shape of the frequency trajectories from imports is consistent uh, with uh, what we observed. In some places, it underestimated the final observed frequency of the variant. And they th think this is because the number of introductions is actually underestimated. Yes. Which makes perfect sense, right? Because you can't get them all. Uh, you don't have perfect surveillance. And so um, they, uh, they look at Germany, for example, where... Uh, they, they reported 2.2 times as many cases with suspected infection than the model predicts versus Switzerland, where the model actually predicted 130 and they re reported 131 infections in travel returnees. So in some countries, the model is perfect and in others, it's not. And they think it's because of the reporting um, of that. So uh, the, the end result is that they feel that... Um, the, 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 the fast growth is explained by behavioral differences and increased travel-associated transmission, uh, mm -hmm. including, right, not just travel, but people getting together, no masks, uh, yeah. not, not enough testing, and so forth. Right? And they also point out that the demographics of this variant differ from the demographics of other variants, so that people, people 30... I think the median age was 30 for catching this variant and yeah. like 35 or something, which is significant when you're looking at large demographic groups um, for other variants. And so the, um, the basic idea is the younger people were more likely to be getting out and traveling. They're also, they have um, more social contacts on average. I mean, as you get older, you, you have fewer and fewer friends. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, sad, but true. Right. And, uh, you know, so they, they, this also fit into the spread of one variant over others. So that's the bottom line. They say an example of how travel combined with large regional differences in prevalence can lead to substantial rapid shifts in variant distribution. And they say without a dramatic transmission advantage, but I would rather them set fitness advantage because that's oh, well. really what it is. Folks, come on. Holiday they travel. Have to use the right search terms for people Hol looking holiday for Holiday travel. Well, the problem is, you know, as you know, when you talk to a reporter and you say transmission, they think of one thing, right? They're not thinking yeah. of all right. the things that fitness encompasses. And that's why the transmission gets percolated. And that's kind of the narrative uh, that we're stuck yeah, in. And, and I think part of why that became the term is because fitness also gets confused in the public imagination. You know, yeah. oh, the virus is more fit. Well, what, works, it's healthier. Works, it works out works more. Out. Uh, Pel we Peloton. don't explain evolution well. Yeah, it's got a Peloton. Right. Yes. <laughs> um, but we do know this virus gets to the gym very well. <laughs> it does. It does very it does. well. It does. I, I just really like the data um, in this paper because I think it, it sort of makes the point very well. It's quite clear. Um, and, and I think that, you know, sometimes with some of the other data like this, um, it can be challenging to look at some of the, the trees and some of the epidemiological evidence and really, you know, make a point to someone who isn't used to looking at those phylogenetic trees. But as yeah. you look at these data, um, you can understand what's going on here. Yeah. Um, and you can really see it. Quite In well. fact, that's if you go to covariance.org, which I picked a couple of weeks ago, my pick of the week, um, it's similar. And Emma Hodcroft uh, established that, and she's the lead author. She's the first author here. And it's very clear. You can do lots of manipulation of the data to see the frequency of variants in different places, how they've changed. It's really good, really very nice. And it's just what we need. Um, I think we're going to see more of this as more experiments are done uh, to sort out exactly, I mean, what is going on. I've, I really think that the main fitness advantage, to quote, Ron Fouché is by evasion of antibody, frankly. I think that gives you a few fold fitness advantage and that's enough to drive a variant uh, and displace other variants in a population. I think that's all it is. And, um, and eventually we'll see that. But we're also going to see, because we're looking so closely, variants that appear to have increased fitness, but actually 
maybe we're just in the right place at the right time. Yeah, like this one, right? Like this one. Exactly. Yes, that's a very good point. So they're going to be variants with improved fitness, and that's why they move through. But then there are these, which are in the right place at the right time. And you know, and now that and this becomes especially prevalent um, if you look at the evolutionary biology of it when you decrease the uh, the caseload in an area that area becomes highly susceptible to founder effects right. because, right. and, and we're, sure. we're going to see this less now that the vaccine is rolling out because new variants will get introduced and they just won't get very far because yeah. people are vaccinated, um, at, at least in the U S and I certainly understand internationally, there are many countries that are struggling with this issue, but in those cases, you're going to see with the non pharmaceutical interventions, as we saw already multiple waves, you lock everything down, you get the cases under control, the cases come down, and then you start opening things back up. The cases are going to come back up. If you have new variants coming in at that time, which this paper is a beautiful example of that, right? Europe got things under control, reopened the borders June 15th. Mm -hmm. Everybody went to Spain, picked up a new variant, you know, brought that and some pictures in the suntan home from vacation. And, and, then you see the rise and the rise is apparently driven by this variant, but it's actually just that that variant happened to be there at the time of the rise exactly. and there weren't a lot of other variants exactly. circulating. Exactly. And that's what's, I had m numerous conversations this week with writers who want to know about the Delta variant, right? Which right. arose in India. It's, it's in the US. It's been here for some time. Was first time. observed in India. First observed, who knows where it first arose. Yes. But, uh, in, you know, they recently have had a huge outbreak and that variant happened to be there and it's driving it, but doesn't mean that it has any particular property. It was just there. And yeah. maybe, but it may be more fit. We don't know. And that could be part of the story. Um, but here in the US, we're, just get vaccinated. Don't worry yeah. about Delta. Just get vaccinated. It'll take care of it. It really will. And and by the way, I just want to jump back to the, the variant naming discussion from last time briefly, because yeah. somebody on Twitter brought up a very good point that I don't think we gave adequate thought to, which is, um, you know, the the broader context of this as virologists, we can say, oh, just name it after the place where it was discovered. And, and that is fine for a lot of things. But in the broader context that we're in right now, unfortunately, and the drastic rise in hate crimes against people who appear Asian, um, we need to be aware that there are other factors at work and perhaps a Greek lettering system is not such a bad idea. Yeah, but yeah, most of the it, isolates are not from China now. No, so they're not. That doesn't but make the issue is, okay, so now you're going to have anti-Indian violence based on an India isolate that, you know, just because India happened to identify this particular yeah. variant first. And, and that is, that shouldn't be the case. That's as virologists, we understand that's totally wrong. You know, it's not anybody's fault. But um, the context we live in is that this this is happening and people are reacting this way. Right. And we and we need to make sure that we do what we can to stop those reactions. And the one thing that I would hope is that I, you know, have only found this challenging in having to kind of relearn names multiple times. And so perhaps in the future, we should decide to go with the Greek letters the first time through um, yeah. so that we we avoid some of those discriminatory problems in the first place. And we also don't have the changing of the names. All right. I understand the principle there. Right. There is no issue with influenza nomenclature. Right. No. And they cause pandemics and they come from all over the place. So I, I just don't understand it. And alpha is meaningless. The problem it's is that so people suck. Pure, yeah, they that's, do. <laughs> that's the problem. Is, okay, so yeah, influenza, we've gotten our heads around this. But if you look back at the history in 1918 and people were talking about the Spanish flu. Yeah, of course. Um, that was that was not a good thing for Spain at the time, right? I mean, No, even in 2009, they, they were saying it came from yeah. Mexico, right? Yeah, I yeah. totally get it. Um, um, but, so th this is, and this is something that has frankly been kind of a disaster waiting to happen in virology for a very long time. We've had it come up sporadically before Four Corners virus, right? You know, and and just every time someplace gets a, a new virus named after it, they say, oh, we don't want that named after us. Um, so maybe as, as a field, virology needs to say, let's come up with a better 
initial naming system so that things don't get named this way. Okay, let's do uh, longitude and latitude. How's that? Yeah, that's it. Coordinates. Are you, what are you, a Mormon? <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? What? Every house in uh, in Utah has a longitude oh, really? and latitude for their house number. Yeah, really? I didn't know Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Um, Mm. Uh, yeah, we could do that. We could put the longitude and latitude first and the isolate number and the year and all that stuff. That's fine with me. Or we could come me. up with some other there, – there are many, many other systems I, one could come I up with. I think the key is to have in the name, if you look at it, you learn everything about it, right? And yes. that's not the case with alpha, beta, et cetera. That is true, but I don't think a geographic designation tells you much useful either. Yeah, it tells you where it came from. Yeah, but so what? But well, no, it tells you where it was first isolated. It was first discovered. Yeah. Right. Well, I think and that's, you that's that useful. It's no longer called Norwalk virus. It's norovirus. So that yeah. I think Norwalk probably pushed back a little there, too. Well, how, I think, how about yeah. it, How about if we go with the alpha and beta and uh, Greek letter numbering system until um, people aren't awful? And when people stop being yes. awful, when people stop being can, awful, we can go with we'll go well, back I, to places. That's a great <laughs> idea. I love yeah. that idea. This is never, a temporary solution. It's never oh, happening. You know okay. it's not going to happen, Brianne, even in your uh, yeah. lifetime. <laughs> I, I was being facetious. People yes. will always be awful. and um, But fortunately, there are a lot of good people. But the awful ones kind of drown the others yeah. out, you know? Um, it's, it's evident in so many aspects. I mean, as a data-driven person... I really don't like alpha. Okay? okay. Put some other numbers there at least that tell me something. <laughs> because in fact, alpha is not just one virus, right? Right. The alpha right. variant. I, I would have been okay with uh, an amino acid based or other numerical system if we could have picked one. Yep, exactly. But I this thing with it, so it's 501Y, oh, it's B117, but B117, what amino acid is that? No, that that's didn't not help. amino acid. I agree. It's the, and the problem okay. is there are more than one Just, amino acid change, right? There, there yes. could be 20 or so, so that doesn't help at all. No. Yes, I think I think we just need a naming scheme that is that is more neutral. Well, you know, the, the original ones were based on the, the clades on the phylogenetic trees, yes. right? And that made sense, but it's not accessible to most people. Right. And so, I mean, someone wrote and said, well, maybe the, the Greek letters are for every man, and then the, yes. this, the other stuff can be for you guys that need to know more. I, I don't know. But then we, when we want to talk to people about them, we have to use two languages. Well, but we kind of do that with flu, right? I, I yeah. cannot imagine um, talking to yeah. somebody, you know, talking to an average person at the grocery store about the a California 2009 H1N1. No, they're going to say swine flu. Yeah, I mean, eventually we will use alpha beta, sure, but I prefer something more granular. And so yes. I'm going to end up having both. I agree that B1.1.17 was not a good one. It didn't really no. tell you anything, but they <laughs> should have. trip off the tongue. Um, but, you know, for flu, they have a, a subtyping based on yeah. antigenicity of H and N, an isolate number. A year is is another thing that's, of course. If we had clearer <laughs> earlier in indications of species origin, that'd be a great way to go. But yeah, well, anyway, um, the ICTV should tackle this. I yes. mean, I think it can do better than alpha. Come on, folks. <laughs> Greek letters. Well. That's what we've got now. And and I just wanted to hop back to that because that comment got to me and I said, okay, yeah. yeah it's an interesting you, comment. Yeah, but, it, but it's, as Theodora pointed out last week, nobody has a problem with the flu nomenclature, except when no, there's a pandemic they, and <laughs> you want right, to blame. But people people are not beating up Spaniards on the street anymore. Okay, so it we need to be a little more sensitive to the fact that the current situation with this particular virus needed a different solution. Yeah, I just think that there are other people who are driving the um, nastiness in the world, yes. right? And yes. you know who they are. And, um, you know, a, a, a simple nomenclature that works well, we have to pay for that. I, well, that's yes. the way That's yes, the way life works. Un yes. Unfortunately, yeah, we yeah. do. Yes, we do. We have to go through a metal detector because of the very small number because of, of idiots, people yeah. who have done things. You have to take your shoes off because of the guy who, who tried to set his, his shoes on fire, right? Yes. All right, enough of this. <laughs> I want to wonder what Jens Again, Kuhn thinks. We just thinks. get rid of all of the people who are awful, and then we're yeah. all set. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> everyone stops you being awful. We're you, good. Yeah, you can't get rid of people, Brian. That's no good, no, right? No, I, that doesn't work either. Change their behavior, I suppose. Change their is behavior. What I meant. Yes. 
Uh, I wish we could do, do you, that. Do you stop at the start at the top or the bottom? <laughs> <laughs> I would start at the top. Actually, mm. <laughs> we have a second paper here, also in Nature: nanobodies from camelid mice and llamas neutralize SARS-CoV-2 variants. We what love are, llamas here. What are they doing? They're they're hybridizing mice with camelids and llamas. Oh my gosh! No, that's not what they're. Well, almost in in a way they are, as you will yeah. see. This is brilliant. So we've talked about. Uh, camelid uh, antibodies before, and they are just brilliant. Um, we should all be camelids. <laughs> um, camelids, um, of course. Is, is it camelid or camelid? I don't know. I've always camelid. learned camelid. it as camelid. Okay. And it, it, it's, it rhymes with camelot. <laughs> and that's where they come from, actually. <laughs> just think of a camel wearing a hat. That's a camelid. Yeah. I put a, I put uh, a uh, nice... Uh, a nice as opposed picture. to llamas with hats. So as you know, in, in us, in humans and many other animals, the antibody molecules have heavy and light change. They have two of each. But in uh, llamas, um, it's just two of, of one chain. It's a heavy chain, two heavy chains. And you can actually take the variable domains and make single domain antibodies. You can make them multimerized to get um, like uh, single chain fragments and nanobodies. So we talked about this. Oh, it was a nice title too. Alpaca llama something or other. Remember Full that? of nanobodies, Full I think. Full of nanobodies. And yep. so here they, I remember that paper, they described uh, camelid antibodies to uh, SARS-CoV-2. And the fact that you can join multiple variable, re in the variable regions of the antibody, of course, is what binds the antigen. You could join multiple of them together and, and get more efficient uh, neutralization. So they have taken this to the next step here and basically modified mice. Oh, this is amazing. They modified mice to make camelid antibodies. They Because as they say in the introduction, camelids are large animals not suitable for academic facilities. And Isn't I mean, that great? Isn't that image great? Of somebody leading llamas into the elevators of the hammer building. It's we great. actually right. have some llamas. I think no, we have goats. That's about as big as yeah. we oh, can. Okay. Yeah. But well, some the, the other the other thing we should point out that's really key about these nanobodies is that they are only containing the variable region, as Vincent right. said. They yeah. don't contain the the FC portion, right. um, and so they're much smaller proteins um, and can sort of get into tighter uh, areas on yeah. uh, the surface of viruses. Yeah. I actually just noticed I have my um, stuffed antibody. Here, so if anyone needs to Wonderful. know about, you need any to have a, uh, a stuffed nanobody now. I, well, a camelid. So the, stu the stuffed camelid nanobody would basically just be this, you know, dark or, <laughs> yeah. or I guess this dark yellow section. Yeah. Um, so they make a point here of saying, you know, these nanobodies can be humanized. They are safe in clinical trials, but they're not widely used because, as Alan said, these large animals are not suitable. There are few reagents uh, to get B cells from camelids to get the antibody genes out. So what they did was to produce these nanobodies in mice. They took 18 alpaca, seven dromedary, and five camel VHH, variable heavy chains, genes, and, and put them together in a cassette with the right promoters and recombination sequences and everything so that they would eventually make antibodies. And they put them in mice and they substituted them into the VH locus. <laughs> In embryonic stem cells, and the mice will now not make their own antibodies anymore, but they will make nanobodies. And guess what they call them? Dixon, what do you think they call them? The mice? Uh, camel like mice. <laughs> Even better, <laughs> nano mice. They're really small. Well, nano mice, nano mice. That's <laughs> nano mice, which, which is a great name, but I think they missed an opportunity to call them la mice. That's right. The other, the other advantage of that, of course, is that you only have to water them once a month. <laughs> but these and are they not can just spit llamas. Up to twenty feet. They're not this just llamas, though. Yeah, they're they, you know they're That's alpacas right. and dromedaries. They're they're, so they're camelids. Uh, they're camelids. Yes. Camelids. Uh, That's right. Anyway, so they um, nano mice is pretty good. They do a number of experiments to show that these mice uh, make proper antibody responses. You know they. Their, their B cells are okay. Uh, they they undergo uh, recombination and they undergo uh, somatic hypermutation to give you high avidity antibodies. Um, 
and and I don't really want to talk too much. Let's go to the SARS-CoV-2. But they, the conclusion is mouse B cells expressing single chain antibodies can undergo affinity maturation and produce highly specific nanobodies upon immunization. They immunize them with a few things, including HIV uh, antigens. Oh, by the way, I didn't tell you who's on this paper. Uh, All right. This is uh, the two first authors are Zhang Lang Shu and Kai Shu. And the two co last authors are Peter Kwong and Rafael Caselas. And this is a big collaboration of people like Michelle Nussenzweig, Paul Binash, Theodora Hatsuanu, David Ho, Vincent Munster. And um, so these are people from the NIH, from Rockefeller, from. Uh, from past episodes of TWIV. Past from, episodes oh, yeah. of TWIV, yes. Uh, so it's a nice collaboration. Um, <laughs> I just love this idea. So now they take um, they take these mice, and they also do a llama, just for comparison. So they immunize three nano mice <laughs> and one llama with receptor binding domain and then the prefusion stabilized spike. So sequentially, right? RBD and then spike, and then they take uh, peripheral mononuclear cells and they amplify out the um, VHH genes, essentially to clone out the, uh, the antibody genes. Um, they do screening to identify high uh, affinity binders and pick, you know, six llama and six nanomice uh, nanobodies. Um, in the end, out of many, many thousands that were generated by, by this experiment, right? You could pull out individual memory B cells and clone out a single antibody from each one. And they have very high affinity, and they can also uh, neutralize lentiviruses that are pseudotyped with the SARS-CoV-2 spike. They have nanomolar and sub-nanomolar half maximal inhibitory concentrations. This is really, really good neutralization. And then the next step is very cool. You can make multimers, as I mentioned earlier. You don't need to have just one antigen binding domain. You can make multiple, you can have two or three, and that gives you an increase in avidity, of course, the combination of the affinity of the individuals. So they fuse these as trimers um, that you put flexible linkers between them. So imagine the, the, the thing that um, Brianne showed you. It's a blob that attaches to the, the end parts that Not attach the to the antigen. You just have that. You can connect several of those together with a linker. And they also connected them to human I, uh, FC um, so that it would have some effector function and also the, the llama counterpart of, uh, of that, that domain. And the doing this um, increases the neutralization efficiency from threefold to 180-fold. Just by multimerizing these, right. isn't that fabulous? Oh, yes. Um, the mo four most potent multimeric nanobodies reached IC50 values in the picomolar range, and they say these rank among the best reported to date for anti-SARS-CoV-2 nantibodies. A little bragging right there, huh? Yes. <laughs> among the best reported to date. Um, okay, so you can make these nanobodies in mice, and they, they compare them to the llama, and, and they're comparable in terms of the, the neutralization. Um, so the nice thing, of course, is now you have tiny mice that you can make these. And you don't need to have a big llama or a camel or well, whatever. they're normal-sized mice, well, yeah, despite but, being called nanomice. Yeah, they're normal-sized mice. they're a whole lot smaller mice. than a llama. Yeah. yeah, mice are easy to handle. I was just thinking this morning, I would not want to immunize a llama. It would kick you, right? <laughs> Do you have to do you have to anesthetize it? You think? I no, think you no. You have to anesthetize it. Really? No, they they're. I mean, they would get immunizations uh, and shots of various types as veterinary care, and I assume that they're probably domestic llamas are accustomed to that sort yeah. of thing. I just like horses. In the, in the early early hours this morning, I just envisioned giving one a shot and then it kicking my leg and breaking my leg. That would be. I could use a dart gun. No, 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 <laughs> no. The veterinarian, the veterinarian goes up to it and and stands beside sure. it so they don't get kicked, right. and they that's give right. it the that's injection. Right. And the, the now, llama might be a little irritated, but I'm sure the vets uh, listening are, are appalled at our lack of yes. knowledge of uh, of how to do this. But now you don't have to worry about. I just remember going to a is it a llama or an alpaca farm? I don't remember. 
And they're very beautiful animals, but they look they at are. you, man. They look at you. I know and they it's do. It's kind of intimidating. I think they're, they're cute. Yes. They're very cute, but they're big. They, they always have them at the at the Big E Fair. They're they're grown for um uh for their fur, especially alpacas, um, oh, for their wool and vicuna also. Um, and yeah, um, and uh, llamas are used as pack animals. There's actually a llama farm next to the Northampton Airport, so I see yep. them a lot. Okay, so um, now they have these um, lovely multimerized nanobodies. Let's look at some variants. <laughs> I mean, I think this is the. Let's go to Spain. Yeah, this is this is why this is paper is so important. This, this is, is a, this is the money shot here. Yeah. When you talk about variants, I mean, this is the, the changes in the variants that uh, cause antibodies not to bind is, in my view, the most important property it, as far as spike goes because it probably is why they're more fit. But also, if you're going to be treated with monoclonals, you have to make sure you use the right monoclonals because it's kind of like treating an HIV patient, right? And uh, AIDS patient, you got to use the right antivirals because they could be resistant to others. So you have to sequence the right loci. Anyway, so they they look at um, the variants. And of course, this paper was written and, and uh, accepted before the new nomenclature, folks. So... They talk about B117, the alpha, which has N501Y. Okay, that's one they're going to look at. Then B1.351. Uh, um, is that the beta? Yeah, I guess so. I think that's beta. I believe that's beta. Which has N501Y, K417N, and E484K. And then we have P1, alpha, beta, delta, gamma. 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 Gamma is next, which is P1. Uh, has sh similar changes at 501, 417, and 484. All of these changes, and by the way, folks, they're not mutations. They're, they're amino acid changes. N501Y is an amino acid change. It is not a mutation. And I'm sorry to be pedantic, but here I am. Um, all these changes. Yeah, because in the next sentence, they use the term, all these mutations were shown yes. to reduce the efficacy of that. Yeah. So they're shown to reduce the efficacy of serum antibodies elicited by Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. And in fact, for some monoclonals, they don't work, right? So how about our nanobodies? How do they do against pseudotype viruses with these changes, these uh, RBD changes? Um, so, NB, so these are nanobody numbers, 17, 19, and 56. They do not neutralize viruses, pseudoviruses carrying E484K alone or together with 417 and 501. NB15, another, uh, NB15, another nanobody was ineffective against N501Y. However, when made bivalent or trivalent, they all can neutralize variants with these changes with the exception of NB17. With really good, you know, picomolar uh, efficiency. So the 44K 501Y changes allow escape from monomeric but not multimeric nanobodies. That's very cool, isn't it? Yeah. I just think that's amazing. And yeah, uh, so so for people who are, you know, not virologists who are listening to this, we have this problem of the monoclonals um, not being effective against some of the variants. And this paper is showing a new kind of molecule we could make that seems to be effective against a broad range of viruses um, and that will get around this problem that we have with monoclonals. Yes. And coolly, this paper also involves the development of mice that will allow us to do make more such reagents in the future. Yeah. They also do these experiments with SARS-CoV-2 virus to show, and I'm very glad they do that because you never know, right? Um, and they the, the same results, you know, monovalent versus uh, multivalent. There's a big difference in neutralization. Now that um, they say these two nanobodies, NB12 and 30, were intriguing because uh, their ability to neutralize was was unaltered by the changes in the RBD, and they say maybe they recognize a, a, re, a different region, and they're going to get to that uh, in a moment. Actually, right now, they're going to get to that. So yep. they do some competition uh, experiments where they, you know, they bind one nanobody to RBD protein, and then they ask, can a second one still bind to the protein when that first one is bound, right? 
So they find all four llama nanobodies. Remember, they had some llama nanobodies as well as mouse uh, nanobodies. All four llamas, but not NB30, could bind the 12 RBD complex. In addition, 30 RBD interfered with 12 binding. Basically, nanomouse and llama uh, NBs recognize two distinct uh, neutralizing regions on the RBD, which is very cool and so consistent with what we were just saying that uh, these these antibodies can access different because of their configuration. They can access different epitopes than say the larger human antibodies. Right. They also happen to mention that they're thermostable and aerosolizable. They remain stable, which means you could potentially put them in a nebulizer and give them to people in their nose, which would might, might be good, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. For treatment. Much better than sitting in an infusion center for, well, you could take it before you get infected, I guess. Now, the next part, they determine the structure of some of these nanobodies complex to the spike protein. And this is important because now it tells you where the antibody, where the nanobodies are binding, right? Because you can look at the picture. <laughs> And there's nothing like a picture, right? Yes. And these both articles today are open access. So NB12 recognize a region. It's around the middle of the receptor binding domain, which they say is outside of the ACE2 binding region. Because remember, all the, many of the human antibodies interfere with that interface. And also, this region where NB12 binds is away from the sites 417, 484, and 501 these sites that are changed in the variants of concern. That's good, right? Yep. That's why they, they can overcome them. They can neutralize them. Um, and then B30 recognizes a part of the RBD at the opposite end of the ACE2 binding area and also from away from the escape changes, the escape amino acid changes. So um, these are binding to different regions than the human antibodies. So then you may ask, how do they, how do they block infection then if they're binding somewhere else? Well, then they look closely and they see that um, even though they're binding away from the ACE2 binding site, they're still, they're still clashing with ACE2 binding to the spike. There's they're mucking a, it up. They're yeah. mucking it up. They call it a, it's clashing. Steric hindrance. hindrance. Yes. Yes. And so that's how they, they block. Um, Steric hindrance, a fancy term for it gets in the way. Gets in the way. Exactly. So exactly. the llama <laughs> antibodies bind the ACE spike interface, just like the humans. But the nanomouse, two of the nanomouse bind outside of the ACE2 binding site, away from the variant changing sites, but still are able to, to uh, prevent binding. So the nanomouse is not just more portable than the llama, it's better for this purpose. It's, it's actually better. making it's making something that you can't that you don't, you don't get from the llama. That's right. So no. I have a question about use in therapy. Mm. Because these are foreign proteins to humans. Will they now make an antibody against the nanobody? They're very easy to humanize because they're so small. Okay. Right. So they, have, if in general, they're going to be somewhat less susceptible to that because they are smaller than right. the full uh, camelid antibody is. Right. right. And they, well, right. So the camelid antibody is the nanobody, which is already lacking the big heavy chain that you would have from other animal. You know, if you put in a, um, a bovine antibody or something that would have a, a huge immunologic potential, um, the nanobodies that camelids produce are already shrunk. Oh, see, I thought nanobody just meant the the BH region. That's right. That it, the camelid right. antibody is the whole thing, that's and right. the, the right. nanobody is just the variable. That's it's correct. just the variable region of that, yeah. but that's easier to make than the nanobody version of, say, a bovine antibody, which would lack the heavy chain, and you got to do a whole bunch of reengineering. These are easier to make into the nanobodies. Is the deal with the so camelid the, ones? The, as I the understand nanobody. It is the combining site basically, right? So basically, yeah. Right. You really can't humanize that, right? You you might be able to humanize a little bit of the framework, but the yeah. actual uh complementarity determining regions, you can't change. I would but think you don't they have would have to. I right. would think they would make the mouse already humanized so you wouldn't have to do it later, like the Velocimouse of um, Regeneron, right? Which has humanized 
uh, antibody frameworks already in it. Um, but maybe you don't have to, Alan, you saying? Is yeah, that because this is such a small, I mean, yeah. your, your own antibodies have a distinct region. I mean, every antibody you produce, every different antibody you produce has something that your body has never seen that's a non-self antigen because that's how it's yeah. going to bind yeah. to a non-self antigen. And your immune system doesn't respond to all of those non-self antigens that are in the context of your antibodies, right? Yeah. Well, I thought you made anti-idiotype. Well, no, you, you, you can't. Make you, you do, okay, so you make anti-idiotype, but it doesn't cause a problem. Right, because you're making so many fewer, you're not making yes. them very well because it's such a small... It's such a small target. Target, yeah. Right. Um, so these nanobodies are that size. They're just the, just the active part. Um, and as a result, yeah, you could get antiotypic antibodies against that, but you're not going to make many, and it's this tiny little target. And so you don't have to do any further humanization of that part of it. Right. Maybe if you were getting treated with them every day at a exactly. high dose exactly. for, for 20 years, that's right. no, that maybe would, that would be a problem. But, maybe. Um, and, no, you know, <laughs> here it is going to be um, a dose and a, a timing with a small molecule where you're not going to see those uh, anti-idiotype or anti-nanobody antibodies um, right. coming up very quickly. So the use case for this is like monoclonals today. If you have people yes. who are not exactly. immunized and they get infected, you could treat them with these, right? Yes. Yep. And you early don't have to, in the infection. Uh, early in the infection, you don't have to worry about any variant because it can take care of it. Um, the, the other use case is inhalation, which would prevent infection right and maybe in a high at a in a high risk person uh, right although you should be vaccinated anyway but this is not going to be for everyone right just no. like monoclonals no. are not for everyone for most people you're going to get vaccinated right? yeah so right. this and also and that's because your human b cells cannot make these nanobodies that's right <laughs> right unless we can Transgenically change everyone, Brian, to make them, which we're not going to do. Nano people. It's a lot of. Uh, hey, don't work. get mad at us, short people. <laughs> <laughs> nano so, people. No, we can't do that, unfortunately. No. These, these nanobodies also cleared virus very fast, as I recall reading. That it was uh, 24 hours and you had no more detectable virus. Is that correct? Uh, the, the previous study that we talked to, well, they didn't do that in this study here, but this oh, has been done previously. No, this oh, okay. is just neutralization in cell culture. But I think- Yeah, this one, they, they have not gotten into humans yet. They have right. not, and I don't recall the last study that we talked about. I don't know what that they did a different there. different paper. Okay, fine. Um, what well, last experiment they do is they say, okay, let's look in the database, the structured database for all of the human antibodies against the RBD, and let's see where they bind- and compare it to where our nanobodies are binding to. Um, and they say, well, recognition extended over much of the RBD. M most human antibody recognition was mostly in the ACE2 binding area, and that's where these amino acid changes in the variants arise. And, in di and in that is different from the regions recognized by NB2, 12, and 30, um, which are different. And they say these are conserved in the Sarbico viruses. Um, and so that's very interesting. Um, and they say that, in fact, NB12 and 30 will bind SARS-CoV-1 spike, RBD, and will also bind the, the RBD of a bat coronavirus called WIV16. And it will neutralize pseudoviruses with these spikes. So cross neutralization. So some of these epitopes, which are different from the ones recognized by human antibodies, which are away from the ACE2 site. These seem to be conserved in Sarbeco viruses. So um, an interesting advantage, right, of, of these nano, nanomice uh, and nanobodies. This could be a very broad spectrum. Could be. Kind of treatment. Right. And so it could end up working like a broad spectrum antiviral. Yeah. So if another corona emer or when another corona emerges, these may be effective against yeah. it, right? Mm -hmm. So they conclude that nanomouse VHHs circumvent RBD antigenic drift by recognizing a sarbico viral conserved region outside of the ACE2 binding motif. Very nice. And this, by the way, is called nanomice version 1, 1 1.0. <laughs> and they say we can make improved versions by putting more VHH genes in um, from llamas, vicunias, and guanacos which we didn't have in our current cassette. We can put even more in. 
Isn't that cool? And they say, we anticipate that this will help popularize the development of nanobodies against infectious diseases. Is it cool? Isn't it? Yeah. Cool? Nano mouse to the rescue. That is, that right. is very, very cool. And Vincent, yeah. um, your question that you asked at the beginning of us discussing this paper um, is now going to end up being a rabbit hole that I uh, spent some time <laughs> reading about this weekend about uh, why we can't all be camels. Um, just in terms of thinking about, you know, I can I can tell you from sort of the theory um, what the pros are of us having heavy chains and light chains in our antibodies. Yeah. And so yeah. I could imagine what that should do to the camel immune response. And now I'm going to end up reading about that's whether a, that yeah. is in fact that's a, a difference great question. That they yeah. have. <laughs> it's an interesting idea, right? Because uh, it's a li it's evolutionarily in a limited number of mammals, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, but they seem to be doing all right. The camels and the lot, the camelids are okay, right? They're doing they, fine. Yeah, they, they, they seem to be doing fine. And so I can tell you kind of what the books would say about why that would be a disadvantage. But now I actually want to know what happens yeah. to the camels. Yeah. I would, yeah. Why, why didn't all mammals follow in this? Were we just too late? Did, or are they just the only ones who came up with it or? So what you could do, uh, Brianne, you could start with the, the nano mouse and start infecting them and see how they respond right. compared and, with yeah, exactly. wild type mice, right? Exactly. The idea would be that the camel should have a less diverse repertoire yeah. than someone who has a heavy and light chain repertoire. And there's no FC fragment, is there? No, there is an FC fragment really? in the camel, but then in these modified nanobodies, they've removed it. Yeah. The right. llama, so yeah, complement the, fixing is out of the question in this case then. Yeah. So I would be interested to know, you know, are camels uh, more susceptible to certain pathogens? Um, because right, they sure. don't have a breadth of their immune response. Well, exactly. they, they get MERS coronavirus infections for it, sure. It, it puts new <laughs> meaning to the phrase, I'd walk a mile for a camel. But they don't suffer from MERS coronavirus infection, do they? Yeah, they get some respiratory they sniffles. Sick. Yeah, they don't, they don't seem to get serious disease. That's correct. It, which uh, may we, be, we, we, they we, do we, get infected at a young age, and that may be part of the uh, lack of right. immunopathology. Well, the Middle Eastern camel population has been ravaged by a number of diseases. Really? Which were rescued by the camels that were originally used to traverse New Z uh, Australia from Darwin hmm. to Adelaide. And those camels... That was during an exploratory mission back in the 1800s. They used uh, disease-free camels, obviously, from the, from the Middle East. And then they released them. So Australia now is a native Because, of course, if you take an alien, pop <laughs> an alien species to Australia, right, you're required right. to release it. Now, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, it camels originated in South America and then traveled over the land bridge into Asia, and they made their way to the Arabian Peninsula. That's and a then reverse... It, and then, it was before my time, but I'll take your word for and it. And then um, yeah, right. in the Arabian Peninsula, apparently, they uh, acquired a virus from gerbils, which eventually became smallpox virus. That's one of oh, the ideas. That part I'd heard, but the land bridge part I had not heard. Yeah, they started yeah. in South America. Oh. They weren't indigenous to... Uh, you know, Africa and uh, the Arabian Peninsula. So this is before the evolution of Bactrian and Dromedary. We're talking about some proto llama thing. <laughs> yeah, some yeah. proto llama thing. Very precise <laughs> uh, <-llama>. language. Yes. <laughs> so the, the story that I heard down there while I was uh, on my sabbatical in Australia was that their camel population saved a lot of uh, Middle Eastern camel populations from mm. extinction mm. by simply reimporting them back to uh, Arabia. Are they resistant to whatever was wiping out the Middle Eastern ones? Uh, but no, but they were a lot healthier, that's for sure. Ah, so they repopulated okay. with healthier strains. And uh, I don't know if that's still being done now. But, but uh, I, I saw a lot of camels on my uh, visits to Australia. When they, um, when they multimerized these uh, nanobodies, I believe they added uh, FC onto those. They added uh, some part of the FC back. Yeah. So okay, so you could fix. Camp, so Brian, would that be useful in some reaction? Like ADCC, it might help, right? To have it, it might help ADCC. It might help fixing sure. complement. Yeah. You could imagine it might even help neutralization a bit because it will give you more steric hindrance. Yeah, mm. and there are a lot of protozoan yeah. infections that could be fought off this way too because 
complement is important for lysis of the organism. Yeah, it, I mean, it also could give you some mm. optimization, so it could be useful for some bacterial infection. There you go. Yeah, you know, we really need to increase the science budget in the U.S. So much we can do. <laughs> you know what? They're they're going to do that. I think they are going to do that. Actually, that, that might actually there, there will be, be some of that. They better. That Dixon, happen. did you ever ride a camel? I was given the opportunity, and I uh, declined. <laughs> <laughs> really. Yeah, I did. I, I didn't. I wasn't particularly motivated to do that. I would have. I've never had the opportunity, but I would. I rode an elephant. I've, read, I've ridden an elephant in Thailand. That's the uh -huh. uh, extent of my uh, – and a, and a horse in Mongolia. Let's not go there because that was an awful trip. I don't want to talk oh. about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I rode a camel at a, at a fair with my daughter. She wanted to get oh, on right. it. She right, was, right, she right, was right, like right. this big and we sat right. on the camel and it right. was just around in a little circle. I mean they don't go fast, so it's okay, right? Right. This one was definitely not going fast. Yeah, I mean, I've gotten on horses that just take off, and I'm scared to death because I don't know how to ride a horse. <laughs> I have no, to say, it's... years ago, I w went, uh, um, I was induced to go, I was forced to go horseback riding, okay? And with well, that scene. <laughs> and this was somewhere upstate. And, the, you know, the, the lady in the stables put us on our horses, and we were all walking. And then my horse turned around and started going back into the yeah, stable. Yeah, exactly. I didn't know. <laughs> Exactly. exactly. I didn't know. I didn't know how to control. It. And the woman That's comes right. up to me. That's goes, right. "What's the matter with you? Don't you know how to control a horse?" I said, "No, actually, <laughs> no. I don't." <laughs> Where's the steering wheel on this thing? That's and right. then, That's right. okay, finally got out, and my wife was right, and she knows how to ride. And her horse took off, and my horse decided to take off. And to I, follow. I, yes. oh, I don't know how to hold on, and I almost got decapitated. Would go oh under these gosh. low branches, and that I does said, happen. "Get me out of here! I want to go it does home." Happen. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Not a fan. Let's do some email. Uh, Brianne, can you take that first one? Sure. Lori writes, hello, Twivers. 82 Fahrenheit, 28 Celsius, partly cloudy in Tumball, Texas. I have been an avid listener of Twiv and Immune and the rest since March 2020. In January, I started listening to old episodes on my daily walks and love hearing the science unfold. Sometimes I am tempted to jump ahead to later episodes to see what <laughs> happens, but that would be like reading the last page of an Agatha Christie novel. Where is the fun in that? Yeah. Is the XMRV story really over? Where is that pan influenza vaccine? What vaccine will cause the next pandemic? Did Vincent ever get around to watching Contagion? Oh, and by the way, Alberta, Canada is rat free, except for lab rats. Because of all the grain that is grown in the province, they are motivated to keep rats out. No pet rats allowed. I just finished listening to TWIV episode 161, Concerto in B with Gabrielle Victoria. What a great episode. Loved learning about germinal centers, which is so relevant today. Tomorrow's episode is Virology 101 Transcription. Can't wait. It looks like I will soon be putting away my TWIV face mask, which I wore with pride. It has served me well. Hoping the world is back to normal soon. Thank you, science. Thanks, you guys and gals, for providing such great podcasts. Best regards, Lori. That's a lovely email. It is. It is. Thanks, and, Lori. Uh, it really <laughs> is. Concerto at B was great, and we have to get Gabriel back and uh, update yeah. us on germinal centers. <laughs> I'm just looking up where Tomball, Texas is, if it's near Buda or any, any other part. Oh, Tomball, yeah. Famous place. So it's uh, it's outside Houston. Okay. Right. Dixon, can you take the next one? I certainly can. Uh, Bob Krug writes, I listened to part of your interesting cap snatching program. Mm -hmm. I have a few comments. There is no doubt that influenza cap snatching occurs on nascent post pre-mRNAs as these RNAs are emerging from the host pol 2 enzyme. I'm reading this carefully not to overlook any detail. Mm -hmm. Beautiful research from Cusack and Fodor established that it is required that the influenza polymerase bind to the LTR of pol 2 to capture the capped five prime ends of host pre-mRNAs. Interestingly, Bartlett, Bartel's lab and other labs have provided good evidence that a majority of the capped five prime ends of influenza mRNAs come from U1 and U2 snRNAs rather than pre-mRNAs. It is not clear how this result impacts 
the results of the cell paper that you were discussing. In mm -hmm. contrast to the situation with influenza virus, it is not known how the Bunya virus cap snatching mechanisms access the capped five prime ends of cellular mRNAs in cytoplasm. The new influenza antiviral that inhibits the cap dependent endonuclease X. Ofluza has an added benefit that it is not shared that is not shared with the older antiviral Tamiflu, specifically because one dose of Zofluza eliminates essentially all the virus within 24 hours. The that's where I got that from. The contagion period in the shortened three to four days oh is shortened by three to four days. As a result, transmission within the household and in the public is strongly inhibited, leading to considerable reductions in the number of people infected and the number of deaths. For example, modeling predicts that administering Zofluza, Zofluza to only 30% of infected people within 48 hours of onset of symptoms could spare about 20 million people from infection and reduce the number of deaths by 6,000. The problem is that many physicians stick to the older, less effective drug, Tamiflu, which does not significantly inhibit viral spread. All the best, Bob, hmm. who writes us, oh, from Austin, Texas as well. So Bob is the discoverer of cap snatching on influenza oh. virus mRNAs oh. from many years ago, the mm -hmm. 1980s. Cool. And Bob has been on TWIV when we visited uh, Austin once. Wow. So, first of all, I think I'm correct that I didn't realize that the snatching is nascent. <laughs> That's a lovely <laughs> thing. The snatching is nascent uh, and occurs on nascent uh, mRNAs, which is cool to know. I miss that. Yes. Um, the idea that most of the capped ends come from small nuclear RNAs is really interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. Huh. And... So Zofluza, is that because more of those are being produced, and so there are more nascent I don't know. strands of them? I didn't know. I didn't know they were capped, actually. Yeah. And finally, the Zofluza is an interesting. I didn't know that either. But you know, the problem is, if you the more you use it, the more likely you're going to get mutants, resistant mutants, and then it's not Probably. it's not useful anymore. So it's so kind I of was, a and I'm wondering how much of the physician bias toward Tamiflu might be related to cost. I don't know if Zofluza is I don't know. more expensive. Not that physicians point. necessarily always think of that, but um, but some do. <laughs> yes, right. some do. Very interesting. There is one, there is one other uh, cap snatching event that I want to point out, and that is at the end of graduation ceremonies for the Naval Academy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're so funny, Dixon. This is a good day for me, so I think I, <laughs> I think I made it through that email without making several mistakes that I could have made. You did a great fine. job on it. Was it was very fine. And thank you, Bob, thank for you listening um, and contributing. We appreciate it. Yeah. All right, Alan, you get the next one. I get John Udell. Okay. <laughs> John Udell writes, Twiv team, many thanks for discussing the UFO that's upstream um, – Frankenstein. Something orf? Frankenstein. Upstream Frankenstein orf. That's right. Upstream Frankenstein orf paper. A great reward for students and postdocs in the trenches doing the hard work of wrestling truths from nature. Um, upstream Frankenstein, Frankenstein orfs were discovered independently by three labs in Glasgow, Mount Sinai, and uh, NIH, accounting for the cast of thousands. Matt Angel, a recently departed postdoc in my lab, discovered UFOs via ribosome, ribosome profiling, riboseq of flu-infected cells. Riboseq is an amazingly powerful technique developed by Ingolia and Weissman at UCSF that makes it possible to determine translation start and stop sites as well as pauses across all cellular translation products. The downside is that it is extremely demanding technically, expensive, and requires considerable bioinformatics expertise to make sense of hundreds of millions of short 28 nucleotide protected fragment reads. Matt, Matt did the riboseq in the paper, and as you surmised, my lab also did the antigen presentation work with uh, Synfecal, S-I-I-N-F-E-K-L, which I'm not even going to bother to spell out the acronym AKA. No, it's amino acids. No, it's amino acids. Uh, I'm sorry. I, oh, right, right. <laughs> uh, sorry, I would have gotten that um, it's okay. if I'd read the, the next part of the sentence, AKA the world's most dangerous peptide, note irony. Love it. <laughs> right. Uh, we used uh, that S-I-A-N-F-E-K-L, synfecal tagging 
mainly to gather additional evidence for the translation of the upstream uh, of open reading frames, not to establish the immunological rev- relevance of UFO encoded peptides. Uh, Synfecal is a sensitive tool for measuring translation due to the availability of transgenic T cells that recognize just a few class one uh, H2KB synfecal complexes on the cell surface. Mm. While synfecal is criticized as an unusually immunogenic antigenic peptide, it is similar to bona fide immunodominant viral peptides in its abundance, affinity for class one, or ability to induce a diverse CD8 positive T cell repertoire. As Vincent insightfully recognized, the UFO data do not directly demonstrate immunosurveillance of UFOs. There is no reason, however, why natural peptides encoded by these uh, open reading frames would not be surveilled, since to date there isn't a single viral protein that I know of that has the ability to avoid contributing peptides for immunosurveillance, joining death and taxes as inevitabilities. (laughs) I like that. Death, taxes, and immunosurveillance. Indeed, the ability of class one of the class one system to monitor translation of viral proteins is astounding. We reported that synfecal on the influenza A virus negative strand is presented to T cells, as is synfecal encoded by the M1 gene in the plus one reading frame after a stop codon using CUG to initiate translation and provides an attached paper. Recently, we found an abundant, highly immunodominant peptide in mice expressing H2LD derived um, what is almost certainly a non-functional gene product derived from what is almost certainly a a non-functional gene product as it is encoded by a 14 residue open reading frame in the plus one frame of the NS1 gene. Waisan Chen had been searching for this peptide ever since he discovered it 20 years ago as a postdoc in my lab as an activity in in flu-infected cell lysates. What's super cool is that Matt found this uh, ARF immediately from immediately from uh, open reading frame, yeah, right? It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. A, not an ARF. Yep. It's an ORF. I was like, wait, an open <laughs> ARF? Because um, it's out of frame? No. What is super cool <laughs> is that Matt found this open reading frame immediately from RiboSeq of flu-infected cells, providing proof of principle of RiboSeq for discovering peptides encoded by non-canonical open reading frames. Note that I don't believe that the UFOs are particularly important for immunosurveillance. I think that this point was overemphasized in the very nice commentary that accompanied the UFO paper. There are plenty of peptides from conventional flu open reading frames presented by human cells, which I will remind you have up to six different classical class one molecules, each presenting different flu peptides, at least dozens, maybe even more than 100. Although they may not be generated as efficiently per molecule translated as peptides from um, open reading frames encoding metabolically unstable proteins, translation of standard flu proteins is so robust, even low abundance viral proteins are synthesized at rates of high abundance cellular proteins that um, drips defective ribosomal products generated co-translationally are sufficiently abundant to result in highly robust peptide peptide generation, even from proteins that are exported from the cytosol, such as HA, NA, and M2. Happy to further explain on Zoom as needed. Mm -hmm. Very best, John. Uh, Bonus information, I've also attached a very recent paper where we correlate the translatome with the proteome proteome and MHC1 immunopeptidome. We have too many ohms. Uh, the repertoire, the immunopeptidome, the repertoire of peptides recovered from class one as determined by mass spectrometry, okay, in human B lymphoma cells. Remarkably, there are nearly eight times as many non-canonical translation products in terms of variety encoded by non-canonical proteins versus standard mm-hmm. annotated protein. Since most of the non-canonical proteins are very short, the total number of amino acids encoded in the non-canonical translatome is 11 million versus 24 million in the standard translatome. Still remarkable. Most of these proteins initiate with non-AUG codons. Many of these proteins are likely to be rapidly degraded and may have minimal biological activity, but this remains to be determined. There's so much to learn. Speaking of which, if you have an urge for self-flagellation, I've attached a preprint of the antigen processing chapter in Paul's Immunology, written by Paul Roche, uh, class two, Ike Eisenlohr, Evasion, and me, Class 1. Those are the things they're working on, not their nicknames. Nah. All right. Well, wow. thank you very much, John. I didn't realize there was such a non-canonical translatome, I guess, an immunopeptidome, 
really. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, that is huge. 11 million amino acids. Wow. coded. That's a lot. I wonder what it's doing. What are these drips doing, these defective ribosomal products? Because they are also displayed in uh, MHC. Right. Well, I mean, I think the idea um, with drips, and obviously, given that John Udall is the one who sort of coined that term, yeah. he would know more, <laughs> more than I would, uh, is that they are, you know, things that get started in terms of translation that yeah. don't get finished. Right. Um, and so there's some issue with the translation and they are, you know, these, these sort of protein debris um, that can still be processed and presented on MHC class one. Cool stuff. Yeah. But so then the question it, is, do they do anything other than trip off the immune system? Right, exactly. Yeah, he, he talked about those one of the times he was on. Interesting. We, we have, may have to get him back on to t talk about these things again, these, um, these non-canonical Right. Like, what are they doing, John? Okay, we'll yeah. get you back. I, I don't know what it says about me that I replied to this email and asked him for a bunch of questions about the Paul chapter. Um, it says you're an immunologist. Yeah, yeah he, he wrote this <laughs> to all of us, which is very kind. I can yes. only think that someone tuning in for the first time and listening to this letter assumes that science not just has its own language, but it has deep thinking its own language. I mean, this has so many layers of description in a single sentence yes that it it's often very difficult for even the people in the know to follow it totally unless it's you're hard. actually working it's on it. it's very hard yeah and in yes. fact even the way we do it is very hard and that's why yeah yeah you know I not agree, a lot of people listen because it's hard and i wouldn't and, say they don't listen no, as i was <laughs> as i was reading this letter i was thinking this is why I can make a living explaining <laughs> science to people. That's right. Because I saw a lot of I can understand up this. <laughs> just, just I'm, I'm right at the edge of the understanding of it sure. as I'm reading it. Sure. But then I could explain it to somebody in terms that would not include uh, a sequence of amino acids as part of the text. Which yeah, um, yeah, sure. So you, I can oh, just yeah. hands in a class that's going for up us. as that's for us. per yeah. sentence. Yeah. Yeah, I, I liked that. And frankly, I think I'm going to steal the idea of Synfecal being the world's most dangerous peptide. That's nice. Yes. I like that a lot. It's funny. Um, no, but science is hard. It, it is hard and it it's is. hard to explain well. And that's there are right. some people who do it. We tend to just chat. And that's why a lot of people, for it's two hours and a lot of people yep. uh, can't listen for that long. And But some people do, obviously, and a good number do, which I'm impressed with. It's great. Well, and the, the magnitude and density of the language, I, I think, is pretty well indicated by the fact that the, when I was just just going through this and I read Synfecal, I, I actually thought the possibility that that could be an, an acronym, acronym for yeah. something. And then sure. I re then realized, yeah, right. of course, that it's an amino acid sequence. Right. All right. One more from Jay. Good morning, Vinny. <laughs> <laughs> Your favorite word. <laughs> Vinny with an interesting spelling. Yeah, it's a different Vinny spelling. With an interesting spelling. Current temperature 9 degrees C. Wow, it's chilly and raining in Boise, Idaho. Keep the non SARS CoV 2 podcast coming. I really enjoyed the cap snatching discussion. I did make it to the end and mostly understood it, though I got lost in some of the details. All of you did a great job in describing the paper. The stick shift discussion brought back memories for me. I knew it would for someone. I knew it. I bought my first new car in 1993, Acura Integra. It was a sweet little car. This was the first year of the new body design. I bought a stick shift, even though I did not know how to drive one. I was living in the Bay Area at the time, so I had to learn how to drive up hills. It was an experience. I can remember many times trying to get up the hill in my house. I learned, and the little car put up with me learning. I kept the car until three years ago. I sold it because my hips would hurt if I drove the car for more than 20 minutes. I put up with it for several years until I couldn't anymore. Now I drive a Toyota van. My hips do not hurt anymore. The van is more practical for me. Easy to fit mountain bikes, swords, spears, and all the other stuff I tend to carry around. I don't want to know. <laughs> I have questions about your life, Jay. And please tell me that the swords, spears, and mountain bikes all get used together. Yeah, I, that's what I'm imagining right now. And that's quite the picture. <laughs> the mountain bike jousting was, uh, yeah. I still have fond memories of my Integra. Thanks again, Jay from Boise, Idaho. Yeah. Wow. Cars uh, are part of your life and they can 
you can have memories of them. It's very cool. Last stick shift I had was uh, my 1980 Datsun 210, which I sold. I, I sold reluctantly when I went to graduate school because I was going to be living in New York City and couldn't keep a car. All right, time for some picks. Dixon, yes. what do we have this week? Well, you know, I forgot that Richard wasn't going to be here, so I got this one specifically for him, but I'll give it to him via this show. I have the first timber frame hotel in North America. Now, I'm, I'm big on timber frame buildings to begin with, and... Um, this is the newest project of Hotel Magdalena. It's in Austin, Texas, and it's got a beautiful design. If you go to the website, you'll just absolutely love this building. You'll, you'll want to go there just to stay there, even though you have no reason to be in, in Austin to begin with. Uh, you may take a trip there just to stay in this hotel. Uh, Timber Frame has swept the, the east of Europe, the uh, west of the United States, but it hasn't made it to the deep south until recently. And so this is the the beginning of a trend that you're going to see a lot of, I think, in the next 10 to 15 years. And that is that this mass timber construction uh, philosophy is that it's better than steel, it's lighter than steel, it's more flexible than steel, and it's user-friendly because it actually captures carbon rather than gives it off in the manufacturing of it. It's made from trees. So this mass timber hotel actually helps to uh, ease global climate change hmm, cool. by capturing and sequestering carbon. And that's the whole idea is we can, if we can make all of our buildings out of this eventually, we may be able to suck out a whole bunch of carbon from the atmosphere. And remember, for every tree you use for this construction, another one grows back. So in 20 years from that time, assuming this building is still standing, you've doubled the amount of carbon that you can capture simply by building out of wood. And this mass timber, so you've used the term timber frame, but that could yes. be confusing to some people who are listening saying, oh, we've had timber frame forever because timber frame. <sighs> well, that's okay because that's it, still mass timber. It's, it's an ancient, ancient that's correct. construction that is, technique. That is correct. Uh, but this is, this is not exactly the same way that your, no. that your timber frame barms. This is, this is a new that's right. design, though, a more that's modern right. design that could be used. And I think the important characteristic of it is it can build taller buildings safely. Absolutely. Right? And, and the joinery of this thing is quite amazing. Actually. Sure. The, 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 actually, this is brilliant. This is absolutely brilliant. And, and yeah, so Richard, it's, it's, Richard has ancient, the option ancient to go meets see modern. It. Exactly. Exactly right. Very cool. Exactly right. Dixon, is there, is there a timber building in New York City? Not yet. Not in this modern technology. Not in this modern technology. Where, where did, you right. showed me a picture of one somewhere else. Where, where is that? I did. Oh, plenty of places. There's one in Minneapolis, for instance. But oh, you've okay, been yeah. to Japan. Minneapolis, You've been yeah. to Japan. The, one of the world's oldest timber frame buildings is in Japan. It's a temple. It's a Buddhist temple. It's 1,300 years old. Now, is that the one that they rebuild every every 300 no, years? No. Or is that – it's an actual – okay. No, this is – if it's had damage, but not to the right. actual frame of it, to, to the roof, yes, but not to the – Because there's another one that I think is in Japan where they have a tradition that every few centuries they build a duplicate building – on the no, other side, is, no, and they, then they burn down the old one, and that becomes the garden. No. But they, but there are also m centuries old actual yes. timber frames yes. that are, yeah. And in, in those buildings, you know exactly how old they are too, because you can actually date the wood. You can date by the rings. At the rings. Yes. That's, that was in a book that I picked um, uh, several months ago. That it's was, fantastic. That's the ring yeah. dating. And so, also, this just looks like a beautiful hotel. It does. It is. It's very it's, nice. It feels as though you're walking inside of a tree. The timber frame Lovely. industry has captured that very well. So at any rate, that, that's, a, that's for Rich and for anybody else who's very interested. Cool. I love this, uh, this description. The 70 covered outdoor patio seats pair best with easygoing company and ice cold martinis. <laughs> Ooh, it sounds you so go. good. This, you know, is a, this is, sounds very good. When I, when I go to Austin, I usually say, stay at the Condit residence, but maybe next time. Right. Right. It looks yeah. great. Demand at least one night in the bunkhouse. Make that bunkhouse. the official TWIF hotel next time. Oh, wouldn't that be good? Well, you know, the two times that uh, I visited, they put me up at a hotel right near the campus, which is gorgeous. It's an AT&T oh, yeah. property. Yeah. Oh, it's so nice. Sure. The restaurant sure. is fabulous. Fabulous. Sure. Brianne, what do you have for us? Uh, so I have a video. Um, 
so there is a science communicator online who's a woman named Raven the Science Maven, and she actually makes songs mm -hmm. um, about different types of science. And this is a song <laughs> that she made about antibodies um, <laughs> that talks through the structure of antibodies, um, the different isotypes in humans, as well as the functions. So if you heard us talking about opsonization and complement fixation and things like that and weren't sure about them, they're all in fact, uh, defined in this song. Um, and this is basically, she's taken a popular song um, called Body by Megan Thee Stallion. Um, my students couldn't believe I knew what that song was when I <laughs> mentioned this to them. Um, and she has sort of rewritten it uh, to be about antibodies. It's very catchy. It will get stuck in your head. Um, and it so just sort of teaches some of the, the basics. That's kind great. That's so timely well, for this episode. Awesome. <laughs> exactly. I have to wow. say, it's I, really I, fun. It's I, really I fun. Am, I am ashamed to admit I had not come across Dr. Raven before, but she looks amazing. She, She's these videos. This is great. They're, so they're great videos. I follow her on Twitter. And in fact, if I remember correctly, uh, she uh, just got her PhD in science education, like within the past week or two. Hmm. Um, so she just became Dr. Ra Dr. Okay. Raven. And um so congratulations to her, and she does a great job. These well, videos are really good. Does she have and, a virus one? Uh, this I must think take she a has ton some, of work. Yeah. This is awesome. I know. They're so good. Um, she does have some that are about viruses, although most of the ones I've looked at are immune-related. All right, Maven, you, Maven, you got to come on a TWIV and sing a this, virus song Yeah, for we got to have her on. She sings this. very well. Oh, yeah. Cool. That's very cool. Um, as you know, many people have written – songs for TWIV, right, which are COVID-related, which are kind of spin-offs of existing songs, right? Yeah. It's called parody, right? And then Weird Al Yankovic made a living doing parody, yeah. right? Yeah. I got an I've email got to TWIV tracks. who, by an irate person who said, you should not have read that. It was the last one we did, Jump on the Bus, Gus, remember that? It was oh, a yeah. COVID parody. Yeah. Sure. She said, you shouldn't do that. That's plagiarism, copyright no, violation. No, she was so no, angry. It is so clearly fair it use. Is not, that is, it is, that is not. absolutely not a copyright violation. And, and we didn't no. make a cent on it. <laughs> no, and I didn't make any money. It's a, it's a parody, no, for God's sake. Right. Don't get so no, upset. it is totally, totally appropriate. This has been, yeah. this is... This is totally settled law. That's Parodies right. are covered by the First Amendment. They are fair That's use. Right. Your That's copyright right. argument, whoever was making that, if they're an attorney, they need to quit. That's, <laughs> but I think they're not. No. I don't think she was an attorney, but she said no, she, of had, course she wasn't. had her own work ripped off. So she was very sensitive. Oh, oh, somebody did a parody of her own work. Uh, she should be so lucky. Uh, um, no. But uh, I said, well, people rip, people rip off my lectures all the time on YouTube. People? They they download them and they repackage them and put them sure. on their channel and get sure. all, and they monetize it. What am I going to do? Well, okay. So, <laughs> so there's ripping off and there's parody. Parody yeah, of is, course, as I say, things. that's totally That's fine. fine. Ripping off is a different story. Um, but ripping I have, off. That's not cool. But but I have a Creative Commons so people can do it. And what if they you want. have a CC license, then as long as they're crediting yeah. you, then. But the then thing is, they often cut out all the, the credits Naturally. and say that Naturally. it's theirs, and then that's not that's right. That's a violation of copyright. And so I wrote to YouTube and I said, and they said, how do you, how do we know it's yours? I said, screw this. I'm not dealing with this. <laughs> screw it. Maybe the, whoever listens will learn some virology. That's the point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, My boy. dear friend, Bob Demarest, for many, many years, a, a wonderful medical illustrator, used to encounter his own drawings in other magazines without his name on them, and they used to take credit for it. And he got tired of suing. He just uh, Vi said, Visual artists have this problem in spades on they the do. internet. Yeah. It's a they huge do. problem, especially in photography and and, yeah, uh, exactly. Other, right. other visual arts. So imitation is the highest form of flattery, unless they're imitating you. But but parody <laughs> is completely allowed. And oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Unless I, it's not slanderous. Yeah, you've got to do something. You've got to do something new with it in order for it to be parody. Yeah. Alan, what do you have for us? I have something that I am so incredibly excited to get back to, and I encourage people to take it up. Um, so this is a game recommendation. But wait, wait. If you're not into video games, don't worry. This is not a video game. This is an old-fashioned sit down at a table with a real human being and some pieces of cardboard and play a game game. Uh, and it is, in fact, if you're familiar, if you've ever heard of a trading card game like Pokemon, where you, you trade cards and you build a deck and you play a game with it, this is the original 
and best trading card game. Mm -hmm. And so I am linking to a video on how to play Magic the Gathering. Um, it is it is one of my nerdy, nerdy hobbies, um, and I'm proud of it. Cool. <laughs> In fact, I'm going to have a group of friends over um, next Saturday, my my regular card playing group, and we're going to play for the first time in person since the pandemic. Nice. Started. Yeah, remember you magic. You will have a gathering. I will. We'll have gathering. a gathering to nice. play magic. That is exactly what we're going to do. Nice. Very good. So this morning, uh, driving in, I, I listened to a podcast called Security Now, which um, is on the Twit Network. This week in tech, which was the original inspiration for Twiv. And uh, it's by Steve Gibson and Leo mm -hmm. Laporte. And Steve, they have a transcript of every episode. And uh, this, uh, this, that's what my link is to today because he began, Steve began with a rant. Um, what did, it was a rant on um, today's computer security. And it's called The Great Cybersecurity Awakening of 2021. <laughs> if you just scroll down a page, you will see it. It's a couple of pages long. And uh, I just want to read a few things. It was just great. I was just riveted. And um, he says he's 87.8% .8 of the world's desktop and laptop machines are running an operating system, which is so riddled with bugs that they needed to stop releasing them as they became ready or no one would have been able to get any work done. <laughs> I mean, that's true. And I look, folks, yeah. there are a lot of people listening who are computer scientists. I think Steve Gibson knows what he's talking about. Uh, just last week, we noted how the latest ransomware, mostly just a handful of PowerShell scripts, was getting into people's computers when they click on a link in a perfectly authentic looking and specifically targeted email that loaded and rendered an HTML web page, which contained and ran some JavaScript, which secretly downloaded some malware and then politely explained to its user that they needed to click once more to open the document. <laughs> it just goes on with all of these issues um, that we're encountering now. And then uh, another one, as for features versus bugs, we were once assured that Windows 10 would be the last Windows ever. Someone somewhere decided that change was bad for security. And they were right, of course. Now we hear rumors of Windows 11. Oh, joy, that's what we need. Apparently, Windows is going to get lovely rounded corners for its rectangles to distract us from the minor detail that all of our desktop icons have just disappeared. We're also terrified now to click a link in email that perhaps not having those sharp pointy corners will calm us down a bit. <laughs> and then finally, this is great. I pointed out, he, he was at a party, I pointed out an AC wall plug that's controlled by a cloud-based service. I explained that the plug was connected back to servers in China and that the software running inside that itty-bitty computer contained in the plug was known to have a handful of remotely exploitable vulnerabilities such that if at any point someone in China wished to infiltrate the house's network to snoop around, it could be done. And I noted that the exploitation of a vulnerability in the plug's firmware would only be necessary if the plug had not come preloaded with a deliberate backdoor, which would simply open when asked to allow access. How would we know? There's no certification process. There's no qualification. We click buy now on Amazon, and that little miracle is on our front doorstep the next day. It may have a UL seal of approval to attest that we won't be electrocuted when we plug it in, but that does nothing to regulate the foreign packets that flow right back from our household's internal networks to a country with whom the U.S. has had a very complex relationship. And he says, now we're deploying millions, if not billions, of Internet of Things devices. And he goes on. And then he talks about accountability, where yep. he says... If your car's brakes fail or if its wheels fall off, there are consequences for its manufacturer. They are accountable. Software companies are not. In every license agreement, they say, it may work, it may not. Yep. We don't know, but either way, the risk is all yours because we did our best and everyone knows that software, despite its name, is hard. Anyway, this is great. I loved it. And it goes <laughs> it's a on good a rant. Bit. It's a good rant. And he's really good. The program is terrific. Um, so I thought, why are pharmaceutical companies liable if they follow the process exactly and they make the vaccine or the drug perfectly well and someone still gets injured? They're still liable. 
whereas software companies are not, you know, things happen. People can lose a lot of money. They may they might lose their lives. Who knows? They're not liable. So I asked the lawyer, uh, Roger Yorgas, about it, and he gave a long explanation. And I said, you better come on TWIV and explain that and with, the, <laughs> with the focus on the pharmaceutical part. So he's going to do that at some point. It's, it's a really interesting difference. It's right? basically for historical reasons. <laughs> right. Because we computers came into our lives very gradually, and the first ones were not expected to do much. And so sure. when you bought an Apple II Plus and you brought it home, you didn't <laughs> expect – your bank information to be secure on it. I mean, it was, it was just something to play around with. And, yeah, and right. so then, you know, this notion of signing away all our rights with an end user license agreement came into being that, Oh no, of course, I'm not expecting my computer to be trustworthy. And now we expect all our computers to be trustworthy and it's a problem. Right. right. Well, so many things depend on them. You, you think they yeah. should, I mean, life, life, Threatening things can happen now, right? We so, need to revisit this. I think and so. Yeah, yeah, there need to be certification processes for these things. Somebody there certainly are in aviation. Yes, you absolutely. can't install you can't install an airplane computer that's not certified, but multiple agencies. Hmm. Dixon, what were you going to say? I was just going to say, you remember Steve Chen? He's yeah. got a job now working for a very large international investment company, and he's their cybersecurity expert. He develops codes that are uncrackable. At least they're so very, far. very difficult to crack. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I mean, nothing's impossible if you got enough time, right? So, I mean, that's that's nature's secret for evolution, for God's sakes. Come on. <laughs> they're safe cracking all the time. But uh, we expect, I guess, I don't know if you could ever have a 100% pure system that is not crackable. All these wonderful movies that are made with, you know, Brad Pitt and uh, George <laughs> Clooney and all those other you know, Ocean's 237 movies that they've got. They've all got these wonderful twists to them. But yeah. in the end, you can get through. You can make – it is possible to make an unbreakable code, but it's extremely inconvenient to use. Ah, well, okay. That's different. Yeah. yeah that's right. That's right. That's right. But, you know, the as he said, the Windows – they just errors. They're errors that they're so big yeah, they can't uh, get well, them all. Yeah. And then you fix true. it and you make other errors. So we call them mutations. <laughs> <laughs> we have a listener pick from David listening to the ABC Science Show podcast this week. I thought their story about putting analysis of the coronavirus to music might be interesting to the team and other listeners. And he provides uh -oh. a link <laughs> with a summary. Molecular biologist Mark Temple from Western Sydney University, who's also a musician has created a sonification of the coronavirus genome with fellow musicians. He presented his music at Sydney's City Recital Hall and spoke with Tegan Taylor. This is a Tate of his creations with more next week. I guess it's supposed to be taste, right? Yeah. Mark Temple's site is at templemark.wordpress.com. Thought this would be a nice break for fans of the show. Thank you, David. Yeah, many people have put nucleic acid sequences Yes. To music, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, absolutely. Very, it's very interesting. You get in, you can get very uh, interesting pieces that way, for sure. It's made in the key of T-sharp. <laughs> <laughs> That's TWIV768. Show notes, microbe.tv slash TWIV. Questions and comments, TWIV at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, we'd love to have your support. Many of you are leaving. You're ending your support, I understand. But, you know, it's not much a month. And... It really helps science communication. So stick with us. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon the pandemic Palmier. may be over, but viruses are not. Viruses are not. And, <laughs> science, right, uh, and the pandemic's not over, of course. Science no. uh, has done so many great things. Uh, let us explain it over. to you. Dixon de Palmier is at trichinella.org, thelivingriver.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. And it was a pleasure, as usual, with everybody. It was a nice harmony of... Uh, Melodic scientific uh, lilts. Impressive. <laughs> I, I can't take that any further. I'm sorry. Very <laughs> impressive. Brianne Barker's at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thank you, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. Alan Dove's at alandove.com and Alan Dove on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. No cat today, huh? No, he's. Uh, I've got the the little hyperactive black and white one this week, so he's bouncing around the house somewhere. I haven't seen uh, uh, on the recording at all. Yeah, I'm Vincent Rackenyellow. You can find me at virology dot 
blog, I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>